Hey, Slider Crusaders, America is the greatest country in the world. Thank you for being here. On tomorrow's show, we are going to go into great detail about the Texas Supreme Court case. Do not worry about Pennsylvania, all right? Don't worry about the Pennsylvania case, um, about the Supreme Court not accepting the Pennsylvania case. This is the one that Ted Cruz was going to argue if, if, they, if uh, the Supreme Court did accept it. Don't stress about it. The left is gloating. Right? They're gloating, oh, even Trump's Supreme Court wouldn't take this ridiculous Supreme Court. Right? No, no, don't worry about it. It's all about Texas. Texas sued Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Georgia directly. Why do they do that? The Supreme Court originally, the original intent was to settle disputes between states. Right? So if a state sues a state, who else would hear it if not the Supreme Court? So that way it goes, whoosh, shortcut right down to the Supreme Court. It doesn't have to go circuit court, state Supreme Court, right? So they sued these other states. This is the Hail Mary for all the marbles. And right now the ball is in the air and we're gonna see Thursday night, probably Thursday night, if the Supreme Court uh, takes the case. And then of course we'll get the ruling after that. But this is the Hail Mary and all the marbles because this outlines, this case outlines all the best legal arguments from every other individual lawsuit in each state. This is the only case that matters. This will give the definitive answer for all the cases, for all the states in one fell swoop. And I should note, it outlines all the cases, all the legal arguments that we've made on this show. So if you've been with us here, you know all the stories already. You know about the curing of ballots in Pennsylvania. You know about the indefinitely confined voters in Wisconsin. You know about the signature verifications in Georgia. You know about the um, uh, unsolicited mailing of absentee ballot applications by the Michigan Secretary of State. We've literally talked about every single one of these stories before. All of these things are illegal, blatantly illegal, undeniably illegal. But what's the Supreme Court gonna say? Are they gonna hear it? Could they possibly say, it's so obvious you guys all broke the law, therefore we invalidate the electors from these states. That's what Trump's team wants. And what that would do, if this is the 270 to win, Biden's like here, it would take Biden under the 270. So neither candidate would have the 270, which would then throw it to the US Congress and Trump would win. That's what Trump's team is asking. And if that's going to happen, this is the case that would do that, right? So that Pennsylvania case that the Supreme Court decided not to hear, that only dealt with Pennsylvania, which wouldn't overturn the results of the entire election. So who cares? The Texas case is everything. Cool. Much more on that tomorrow. I'm trying to think if there's any other noteworthy thing about it. Um, I think that's it. So tomorrow we'll go into, into more detail about each of uh, the arguments. I want to talk about COVID here. If you remember back in February, before COVID, we talked to John Tierney. John Tierney is the former science writer for the New York Times. He has a new book out, called, or was new at the time, called The Power of Bad. And the main point he made was that there's three principles that he follows whenever he watches the news. Number one, the world will always seem to be in crisis. Number two, the crisis is never as bad as it sounds. And number three, the solution could easily make things worse, all right? So the world's always in crisis, it's never as bad as it sounds, and the solution can easily make things worse. It's Chicken Little. Everyone's heard the story, at least. You may not remember all the details, or you may not remember the ending, but an acorn falls on the chicken's head, and she thinks the sky's falling, runs around like a lunatic. We all know that part of the story. Friendly reminder, the end of the story, the fox invites the chicken into his den for shelter. Oh, the, yeah, you're right, the sky is falling. Here, come come with me, I'll keep you safe. Then he eats her. Tyranny's point is, this is what happens in these crises. We overreact to an either completely imaginary or very hyped up threat. And as John Tierney said, there are a lot of foxes out there who are very happy to profit from our fear by proposing some solution that makes their lives better, but actually hurts everyone else, just like the fox. Have you seen this clip from uh, Cuomo? So Cuomo in New York is interviewing Fauci. Now listen, as we play this, I know it's a joke. I get it. People are allowed to joke, have fun, whatever. But it also reveals something that I think is true. Here it is. 
Maybe we enlist you. I'll do it with you. We'll do an ad telling New Yorkers it's safe to take the vaccine, to, uh, to you know, put us together. We're like the uh, modern-day uh, De Niro and Pacino. You can be which whenever, whichever you want. You can be the De Niro or Pacino. <laughs> Fauci and Cuomo, I'll give you a friend. Who, who do you want to be, De Niro or Pacino? Which one do you want to be? I love be? them both. <laughs> you... I love them both. Uh, so all right, all right. Other. If I say one, I don't want to hurt so, the feelings of the other. Yeah. So one. Who's the politician? <laughs> all right. All right. So Cuomo, Newsom, the governor of Michigan, all the top governors and, and people who are, are pushing all this COVID stuff, they truly, deeply, profoundly believe that they are heroes. Like, like the men who invaded Normandy on D-Day, like, D like our Pearl Harbor survivors, like Chuck Yeager, who just passed away the other day. Our governors, they, they think they are God's gift to men, called to lead at just this time in history. There's two different types of tyrants. You have evil tyrants who do evil things for evil's sake. But then you also have the tyrants who think they're doing it for your own good. Does that make sense? You have evil tyrants who do evil things knowing that these are evil and bad. And then you also have tyrants who do bad things thinking they're doing it for your own good genuinely. Here's C.S. Lewis who spoke about this. He said, my contention is that good men consistently acting upon the proposition that they're good would act as cruelly and unjustly as the greatest tyrants. They might, in some respects, act even worse. Of all the tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It would be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. Can you think of a better term than for Newsom and Cuomo and the rest? Omnipotent, all-powerful, moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity, I agreed, may at, at some point be satiated. But those who torment us for their own, for their own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. They may be more likely to go to heaven yet at the same time likely to make a hell of earth. This very kindness stings with intolerable insult because to be cured against one's will, that's what they're doing to us, right? They're curing you against your will uh, and cured of states which we may not regard as disease. It's like, oh, I don't even need curing from that, thank you, is to be put on the level of those who have not yet reached the age of reason or those who never will to be classified with infants, imbeciles, and domestic animals. Does that make sense? So he's, he's like, listen, to be cured against your will and to be cured against things that you don't even think is a disease, you're treating me as either an infant, an imbecile, or an animal. But they're doing it for your own good. To them, they're, they're, either, uh, they're either De Niro or Pacino, right? Which, which one are you in, in, our, in this drama of the COVID lockdowns, Fauci, right? They think they're the heroes. They've made up these movies in their head and we're all forced to live in it. Where the world is doomed and they're the one last great hope to save all of humanity. It's up to me. It's called the hero complex or, or sometimes called the savior complex. And there's two different strains of it, right? So in normal, in normal human interactions, most of the time, the hero complex person is the person who seeks out broken people thinking that they're the ones who will save them, right? So I look for broken people as being relationships, uh, like, like romantic relationships or friend relationships or whatever. You f you'd look for broken people to save, right? You're the hero. There's a branch of this, though, where it's politicians who go out of their way to break you and then fix you. It's politicians who go and break things and then fix them, and then expect you to thank them for it, right? It's the old line of the politicians, they break your legs and then give you crutches and say, you wouldn't be able to walk without me. It's like, oh, well, you could have just not broken up my legs too. That would have been nice. Just think about it here in California where I live. Newsom, he loves power. 
and no governor has ever had this much power. There's 38 million people in California. Newsom is the dictator of a country. California, if it was a country, it would be the 36th largest country in the world. And everything we can do here in California is at the whim of the governor like never before. You can't go to work. You can't, it's, it's against the, his dictate to open up your restaurant, your business. You can't be outside past 10 o'clock. I was at a restaurant the night before everything shut down. It was like 9.15 and the restaurant cleared out. And I asked the waitress, so what's going on? She said, oh, curfew. I said, curfew? What are you, cur curfew for what? They, they haven't even pretended to give us a scientific explanation for that one. So Newsom has unprecedented power. I mean, Cuomo had to be reined back in by the Supreme Court when it came to closing down churches. So you have a man who loves power, first of all. And on top of that, I'm sure he's deceived. But like the people around him, they just pump him up every day, all day. Oh, governor, you're saving lives. Oh, governor, thank you so much. What would we do without you, governor? You're doing the Lord's work. And either people have lied to him or he's lied to himself enough where he actually believes it. And that is the worst position that we can be in. And you compare that to someone like the governor of South Dakota. What's her name? Like Noam or something. Like, or the governor of Florida. Or these, I don't know, like, people we haven't even heard of. Like the governor of... Alabama or Mississippi, I don't even know who that is, right? But they're not using this to take power. Trump never used this to take power. But the governors on the left sure are. And once these governors taste this power as they have, they will never, ever give it up. Jesse Kelly said yesterday, he said, you know how these lockdowns end? You know how they end? You end them. That's the only way they'll end, is you end them. They will, the, the politicians will never end them on their own. It's entirely up to you. And once they think they're the saviors of the world, <laughs> you think they're going to give that power back? It's entirely up to you when you take it back. It's also up to you if you're going to protect your home or not. Home title theft. Uh, your home title's online. And a hacker just gets it. They forge your signature, they just trace it. And they take out what's called a quit claim deed, which states that you sold your house to this person. And then that person takes out loans against your home until all your equity is gone. Super shady, right? And the county doesn't know this is happening. They think it's you. And you don't know this is happening until the collection agencies start calling. Right? Does that make sense? Like the county doesn't call you up and say, hey, is this really you? Like, like they got your signatures. They got everything they think they need. Only home title lock calls you up. Anyone touches your title, they let you know. And they'll spend up to a quarter of a million dollars in legal fees to restore your home's title. Because right? you don't own your house anymore, according to the county. You gotta get it back. So this is just part of owning a house. I mean, think of, think of how horrible this process would be alone. After the fact, you gotta deal with the collection agencies, you gotta deal with the county now, you gotta deal with lawyers, you gotta go to court, you gotta pay for all that. It's just part of owning a house. It's like, uh, it's like replacing the air filters, right? <laughs> it's just something homeowners have to do. Go to HomeTitleLock.com, register your address. You can see if you're already a victim. And use the uh, code RADIO for 30 days of free protection. HomeTitleLock.com. Hey, Senator Crusaders. So uh, Brown University has been compiling data on the schools that have been opened. And they have found that, this is from the Financial Times, only 0 0.02, okay, two one hundredths of a percent, 0.02 percent of students and 0.04 percent of staff have tested positive for COVID in schools that have reopened in the United States. Okay, what are we doing? Gavin Newsom, his kids go to a private school that meets in person, Governor of California. Uh, no one else can. No, no public schools are meeting in California. Um, and we're told that we got to follow the science, but not that science. And Biden said yesterday, he said he wants to open up schools as quickly as possible when we get more funding, which is what this is all about for the unions. And this is so despicable and evil what the unions have done, sacrificing your kids from an entire year of education just so that they can use it as leverage to get more money. It's, that's so sick, but we'll save that for another day. Also in California, all the hotels are closed. In San Diego County, where I live, 77,000 people in this industry are not working. 
But we're told that the left, not only they're following the science, but they're also looking out for low-income people. One of the uh, managers of the hotel, one of the big hotels here in San Diego said, this hits everyone hard, but it's the hourly employees that are hit the hardest and that, are, that this affects the most. But you're the bigot. New York Fed came out, 41% of black-owned businesses have shut down. 41%. And we're told by the left that they care the most about minorities. And we were told that you should buy from, from uh, black businesses. Oh, and also we're driving half of them out of business forever. John Tierney, he, uh, the reason I thought of him in, in the last segment um, is he wrote a new article in City Journal. And he wrote about 1349. All right, so get your mind right. Because when I first read that, I thought he was talking about 1949. And I was like, oh no, he must have been 1849. I was like, no, no, 1349. The Black Death was just ravaging across Europe, right? A real plague. Could you imagine telling someone who lived through the plague about COVID? Could you, like, be like, oh, wow. The, the guy from 1349 would be like, wow, I hear you guys have a, a really crazy pandemic going on. Tell me about it. Like, yeah, well, well you, you get it. Uh, and then, I mean, 80% of people don't even know they got it. And if you get it, you mostly just, you got like the sniffles for a couple days and you're fine. <laughs> but, but some people do have to go to the hospital because you get a night. And our president got it. And he was fine like a day later. But they would, like, they would laugh in your face, if not punch you in the face. But anyway, back then, the officials came up with, a, with this pandemic control strategy. Okay, so in 1349, they had a pandemic control strategy. Here's Tierney. The, uh, this protocol, not mandate, protocol, was precisely regulated by the experts. They had experts then too. Three times a day for a total of exactly eight hours, hundreds of men known as flagellants would march in single file through town wearing hats with a red cross and carrying whips of knotted ropes studded with nails. This was a witness back then, 1349. Using these whips, they beat and whipped their bare skin until their bodies were bruised and swollen and blood rained down, splattering the walls nearby. So you can see in that picture right there, they had these whips and it would uh, be like three tails on each whip and there'd be nails on the end of the, the tails here. And they would whip themselves as they were walking, marching down the center of the street. They would whip themselves and then they uh, just pain and exhaustion. Eventually, if someone fell down, then everyone would start whipping on that guy. And they did that for exactly eight hours every single day. Okay? That's what the experts suggested. Here's John Tierney. This specific strategy is no longer in favor among public health officials, but the spirit of the flagellants lives on. Instead of beatdowns, today's regulators favor lockdowns, which are less bloody, but inflict more social pain. For all the talk about following the science, the authorities and much of the citizenry can't resist the primal intuition that a pandemic can be quelled only through public penance. And that is the key of all of this. Penance is the voluntary self, uh, self punishment inflicted as an outward expression of repentance for having done wrong. Right? The voluntary self punishment that you inflict upon yourself to prove how guilty you are. It literally, the root of the word, the etymology, the root of the word literally means is not enough or is unsatisfactory. That's what penance means. You beat yourself to prove that you are not enough in front of the gods and the public, right? We're no better than the people of 1349. Maybe worse. Because as Tierney said, at least back then, it was only a select few who took the beatings themselves, and they were beating themselves, right? Today, it's Newsom and all these other governors beating everyone else, beating you. Or at least half of our country, right? at least uh, you know, rich white people are fine. Poor black and Hispanic families, they're the ones suffering the most. They're the ones mostly taking the beatings. Why is Newsom such a racist? We got to the bottom of that. And we got to the bottom of why Newsom hates black families so much. Why he hates Hispanic families, keeping them out of school, getting rid of their jobs. Pretty amazing. But uh, that's the rub, right? Like, we just talked about that C.S. Lewis quote. Um, but the hero complex. 
a savior complex. One last year thing from Tierney. Um, the more painful the measures, the more virtuous and heroic they feel, they being our governor. Whenever evidence emerges that lockdowns are ineffective, the proponents have a ready answer. Well, not enough people are following the rules. Stop sinning. Do your penance. Going out for a walk or taking a vitamin D pill, washing your hands and all the rest, too easy. It's too easy. It entails no pain and provides no glory or power to public health officials or politicians. So they rarely give this advice, despite the evidence that vitamin D helps the immune system against viral infections. So whatever common sense measures could have been taken, it's not enough. We need everyone to do more. We need everyone to shut down. We need everyone to be scared. Uh, yesterday at 12 o'clock, uh, every phone in California got alert, like an Amber Alert message on their phone, like sirens, are, woo, 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 and everyone checks their phone. And it said, don't go outside. COVID emergency, viral emergency, don't go outside. <laughs> like what? Like meteors were coming down or something. We gotta cancel everything, they say. The mayor of LA last week said cancel everything. That's penance. That is a penance. You need to do more. It needs to be more painful. Cancel everything except, of course, you know, TV shows. They, they are exempt. Uh, ski resorts are open. The French Laundry, they're exempted. But everyone else, do your penance. Don't go to Thanksgiving this year except for me. The latest for that is in Chicago. Uh, some Democrat city council member, an alderman, owns a restaurant in Chicago. And it turns out he's been running like a speakeasy in the back of the restaurant, seating people inside. Are you kidding me? He called it an error in judgment after he got caught. As Tierney said, these painful measures give at least the illusion that something serious is being done. But not for the politicians. They're not whipping themselves. Not for the rich. They've doubled their savings in the stock market. And don't have to commute anymore. But everyone else, you need to do more. You're not doing enough. Amazing. We're no different, certainly no better, than the people of 1349. And they would laugh and laugh and laugh at how weak we are. Patriot Gold Group. Uh, this is the most recent Google review. So they're A-plus Better Business Bureau, five-star consumer affairs, four years running, uh, number one gold IRA dealer, five-star Google trust pilot, right, Paul? Uh, this person said the team at Patriot Golden are, are amazing. They helped me roll over my TSP, in, which I think is like a, what's that called? Like a trust savings plan or something, into a self-directed IRA and paid the fees as well as waived the cost of storage for my metals. Someone else said, every person I've had the pleasure of speaking with has provided all the answers to my questions concerning precious metals investment. I'm very pleased with Patriot Gold Group. And that's my point. If you have any questions about gold or silver, Call Patriot Gold Group. They, have a group. they have amazing customer service. And just know that you're buying literally the most stable and secure thing that has ever been known to man, right? We're just talking about 1349. Gold. For thousands of years, wars have been fought for gold. As a child, you searched your backyard looking for pirate treasure. And what's always in the treasure chest? Gold. <laughs> and only ever gold. And now you just can have it. You just, it's just mailed to you. The UPS guy just drops it off at your house. And know that where it's always been a value for thousands of years, it's always going to be a value for thousands of years into the future. It's an amazing thing, and it's yours. 1-800-798-4260. 1-800-798-4260. Give them a call. PatriotGoldGroup.com. Hey, Saturday Crusaders, we did a show last Wednesday, it was December 2nd, and I can't stop thinking about it. Uh, Grant McCracken, he has a new book called The New Honor Code, uh, a simple plan for raising our standards, standards and restoring our good names. So we talked to him, we've talked about Hillbilly Elegy, uh, which you should watch on Netflix. We, we talked about Karate Kid 2, which is set in Japan, and these are all honor cultures, Appalachian South, Japan, uh, ghetto culture in the cities is an honor culture as well. There's good and bad to honor cultures. There's good things about it and there's not good things about it. But the good thing about culture in general is you can change it. Right? You can thoughtfully and thoroughly examine culture in your home and in, in larger settings and take the good things 
take the good things of different cultures and embrace them and then remove the bad things. Now, the left says that's cultural appropriation. You can't do that, but reject that. Of course you can. We can look to, um, let's just take, uh, not, I, I believe in our culture today, we don't honor our elders. But if you look at Japanese culture, they have extremely high esteem for our elders. So we should take a little bit of that, for instance. So here's the problem with our, how our honor culture has eroded in America. Uh, back in the day, everyone agreed with the fact that there were moral, objective truths. We'll talk more about this with our next guest coming up next. There are moral, objective truths. There is good behavior and bad behavior, righteous and unrighteous. Everyone agrees with that. And everyone agrees what those good things are and what those bad things are. So you build your honor by acting righteously and by doing these good things. And you can also lose your honor by acting dishonorably or immorally. So you build your honor and everyone knows it and everyone honors that. And there's a lot of examples of this in, uh, in ancient honor cultures. And I wanna share a couple of those stories. Lucius Aemlius Paulus, he won a battle against the uh, Macedonians. But his troops were, were not happy because he had a lot of discipline. He was a tough ruler, a general, and his men didn't think that they gave him enough of the treasure that they got him. So there's a bit of a mutiny going on. Right? So Marcus Servilius, he stood up to defend the general. right? And he said, whatever you do, do not follow that guy. Servius Galba was the other guy that the mutiny people wanted to follow instead. Okay? So Servilius stands up and he says, do not follow that guy. Here's what he says. He says, listen to the decree of the Senate rather than to the romancing of Servius Galba. Listen to this that I am saying rather than to him. He, Galba, has learned nothing but speech making. And that only to insult and cal calumniate, it means to lie. I, I have fought three and 20 times in answer to challenges. From all whom I encountered, I carried off the spoils. My body, here's the key, my body is covered with honorable scars. Everyone received in the front. As an old soldier, I've often shown this body of mine hacked with the sword to the young ones. Let Galba strip and show his smooth skin with not a scar upon it. Gaius Marius, it's about 100 BC. This guy was a uh, farmer, but he wanted to climb the rat. I think we have a picture of, uh, ooh, let's stop. What? That's not flattering at all. I didn't, I put the painting up. The painting is much nicer. Much more honorable there. So he was a poor farmer, or the son of a poor farmer, and he wanted to climb up the ranks, so he joined the military and earned his way up to become a general. And here's what he said about this. He said, I cannot, I cannot, to justify your confidence, display family portraits, or the triumphs and consulships of my forefathers, right? So he's saying, I'm not rich, I don't have a powerful family. But if the occasion requires, if I must prove myself to you, I can show spears, a banner, trappings, and other military prizes, as well as scars on my breast, not back, chest. These are my portraits. These are my patent of nobility, not left to me by inheritance as theirs were, but won by my own innumerable efforts and perils. How good is that? Alexander the Great, he uh, faced a bit of a mutiny as well. And this is what he said. He said, which of you is conscious that he's labored more for me than I did for you? Come now, whoever of you has wounds, let him strip down and show them, and I'll show you mine in turn. For there is no part of my body in front, at any rate, remaining free from wounds. Nor is there any kind of weapon used, either for close combat or for hurling at the enemy, the traces of which I do not bear on my person. You see the theme here? Honorable action from the front, courage. My favorite story of this, uh, there was, uh, I think this was in Greece, uh, there was a trial and the uh, lawyer told the defendant, right, the guy who's being accused, to take off his robe and show everyone your scars, right? So he took off his robe and showed everyone these scars, which is a way of showing your honor, right? Look at all the honorable behavior, how strong, brave, courageous, trustworthy, honorable you are. Then the lawyer asked the rich guy, the, the, the accuser, to take off his robe. Right? Take off your robe so that the people may see your scars inflicted by the bites of women, the traces of lust and luxury. 
How good is that? So this, this accused here, while he's off, been off at war, fighting battles for us, the accuser has been at home, getting, getting scars, sure, but from the bites of women in luxury and lust. Amazing. I think you know who won the case. Now, one could argue that we don't have men of action anymore, but really it's because we don't have honor anymore. Why don't we have honor? We've got to go back to the beginning because there's no more objective morality. Who are you to say what is good or bad? What is right or wrong? What is righteous or immoral? So if we can't agree that there are moral truths, then we're certainly not going to agree what the moral truths are and what honorable behavior is. So instead of honor, we've replaced it with something. We gotta replace it with something because we have to have some like method of creating hierarchy, right? We're, we're a hierarchical people, that's just our nature. You can't avoid that. I mean, communist countries try to keep everyone equal, but it, it never, never works, right? So you, we have to have a hierarchy. So what are we based off of? If not honor, if not honorable behavior, what do we do? Celebrity them. Celebrity them. Just get famous. And you get famous any, any way it takes. Do whatever it takes. Doesn't matter. There is no bad behavior because who are you to say? Right? We know why Kim Kardashian got famous in the first place. Doesn't matter why. Doesn't matter. Just that she is. And she's at the top of the hierarchy. Not for honorable behavior, but just because she is famous. And there's many, many examples of that. Being a celebrity is of higher status than honor. And maybe even worse than that, being a victim is an even higher honor. Right? So I guess today's speeches would be, look at all these wounds I have on my back that I've never recovered from. Oh, I'm so weak, I can't even. What a weak culture we've become. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. Critical race theory, that's what this all is. This idea that our identities are not based off honor. They're not based off of achievements or even effort, but they're based off of our identity, our race, our gender identity. And then more than that, it's based off of our victimhood. Now you know how it used to be, how it used to be done in Western civilization, which we are um, dishonorable heirs to. Critical race theory update next. Spread the word. Hey, Slider Crusaders. So we've talked quite a bit on this show about critical race theory. And I hear more people talking about it, but I want to make sure that we have a really firm grasp of what we're up against. Otherwise, we can't speak against it. Uh, our friend Mike Gonzalez is here. He is the Angeles T. Arredondo E. Pluribus Unum Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. And he has a new report out at the Heritage Foundation. You must read it. It is called Critical Race Theory, The New Intolerance and Its Grip on America. Mr. Gonzalez, how are you, sir? How are you, Mike? Just call me Mike, as you Man, know. Good. Thanks good. For, thanks for I'll having do it. me on again. Good to yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for being here. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, or let's start, I'd like to know what the alternative is. So let's talk about the way things were. Because sometimes we have a tough time defining that because we just grew up this way, right? We grew up in this soup and we don't really know what we are or how we judged people or whatever. So how have we always done it in America? Well, critical race theory grows out of critical legal theory, which itself grows out of critical theory. And critical theory itself starts in 1937 in a paper by the director of the Frankfurt School, Max Horkheimer, which is called traditional and critical theory, in which he juxtaposes traditional theory with critical theory. And he says traditional theory is, it fetishizes knowledge, is too, believes too much in, in absolute truth and objectivity. And he says critical theory, it's more after social change. It, it does not believe that you can actually be objective. And what it is after, it is, is creating a new alternative to the reality that Horkheimer and the other Frankfurt scholars saw in the 30s. Just to finish that thought, they were all Marxists. They were, they were new Marxists, they were neo-Marxists or Western Marxists. They believed that society was broken up between categories of the oppressed and the oppressors, and that the, the oppressed needed to be given the ideological tools to throw off their shackles. So this is Marxism, but not 
economic Marxism, cultural Marxism, today critical race theory is the same thing here in America, but does everything through the prism of race. Okay, so I love this. So you have traditional theory and then critical theory. And right. then you say from that came critical legal theory. Um, yeah. Can you, can you maybe give us, give us an example of like just basic critical theory, like the original use of it, and then maybe an example of critical legal theory, and then we can get into critical race theory. Does that make sense? Well, all three uh, share very uh, strong thematic links. They believe that uh, you achieve change through a ceaseless, unremitting criticism of all the norms and traditions of the West, of, of the United States, that you must mm -hmm. subject uh, all the institutions to a, a systematic criticism in order to tear them down and replace them with a, a, a counter narrative. Uh, critical legal theory believes that the uh, that the oppression is expressed through the legal system and the jurisprudence, the, the, the legal philosophy of a country, that the laws are written by the wealthy to protect the wealthy. Uh, and then critical race theory uh, departs from that, but but really, really, con as, as its name would suggest, right? I was in a debate the other day at the uh, the the, the, uh, the Philadelphia Society, uh, and they and, and somebody said, "Well, of course, critical race theory looks at everything through the prism of race. That's its name." <laughs> yeah, I'm not accusing that <laughs> the practitioners of of yeah. that. I'm just saying that the the everything is because we have supposed to have racial dynamics. Uh, obviously, th that is wrong in my view. Uh, you know, we can have relationships and, and conversations and, and, and dynamics that have nothing to do with race. Uh, in fact, we should strive mm -hmm. to do so. I'll give you two very silly examples from today. So <clears throat> I guess someone on Vice was interviewing a white boxer who knocked out a black guy in, in the boxing ring. And the question was, do you feel bad or do you feel guilty for having knocked out a black man? Okay, that was yesterday. Today's example, Lori Loeffler, Laughlin or whatever, the, the college person who like paid to get her daughter into college, the daughter went on Will Smith's ex-wife's podcast or whatever. And the three black women there were criticizing the daughter for seeking uh, uh, penance, really, for, for seeking forgiveness from black women. Right, because it's not black people's job to uh, to forgive white women. How could you put that burden on us, black women? So it's like those are just the two examples off the top of my head from the last twenty four hours of everything is racial. Everything, every announcement. I just saw an announcement. The first referee of of uh, Indian uh, descent will work in the NBA. I mean, who who cares? Who cares? <laughs> it's, it's half Indian or half black, it's her policies, right? It's her policies that are important. Who care? I have never started a sentence in my life. And I tell you, Mike, I write a lot. I have never started a sentence saying as a Cuban American, because why should you care? When you want to know, you want to be able to analyze my ideas and, 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 and subject them to a reality test and say, I don't care if you're writing as an Eskimo, Mike, you know, but this, this what you just said makes no sense. Or, or say, yeah, okay, you convinced me. Uh, but so this okay. idea that everything has to do with your sex or with your uh, uh, country of origin or with your race or with, with your ethnicity is at the very heart of everything we're being taught right now. So I know why we don't do it, as you just said. Why do they do it? Why does the left embrace this? What's their end goal with it? Well, it's a way to... Uh, so so. I think that we should not impugn the motives of everyone that does it. I think there's a lot. I had a debate yesterday with a journalist who she did seem to believe that there was uh, that, that, that everything is, is, is racially based. Right. Uh, the 1619 uh, project idea of America is beginning when the first Angolans arrived, the first Africans arrived in, on these shores in 1619. And that's the beginning of the country. And everything everything since then really has been about slavery. Well, no, not everything has been about slavery. Slavery is a part of the United States history, a part that we need to contend because it's a, it was a tragedy and we need to understand it and deal with it. But not everything is about race. Uh, so some people do believe that. Other people, I think, use that when you say, well, the United States is systemically, structurally and institutionally racist and we must change all the systems and structures and institutions 
They do it on doing it on purpose. You know, they want to, for example, all the critical race theory trainers from Robin DiAngelo to Ibram X. Kendi, all of them say they hate capitalism, that they want to change the system of capitalism. All the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement are on the record as saying that we must smash capitalism. They want to replace it. In the in the case of Ibram X. Kendi, he tries to be really too clever by half because he says, he doesn't say he's a socialist. He says, no, I'm going to be an anti-capitalist. His book is how to be an anti-racist. So every so he says, I'm not going to say, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say I'm an anti-capitalist. So what else is yeah. there? What's the alternative? Yeah, communist. Um, so let's speak to that because you're right. There's <clears throat> there's the leaders and there's the followers, right? So let's. T- I'm more concerned at this moment, at least, about the followers, right? The the person who thinks they mean well and is kind of got sucked up in the whole thing, right? So this is your friend, your neighbor, family right. member, right? How would you suggest we talk to them about it? Because you know all the tricks, right? The tricks are if if I go and say, hey, not everything's about race. Oh, that's your white privilege speaking. Of course, to you, not everything's about race because you've never blah, 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 blah. So how do I, white guy, talk about this to people who are getting tricked by it? Well, I think that you need to do, Mike, something that I'm, I'm told I'm very bad at, which is use emotional language or, or use uh, vignettes. Uh, the left is very good at that. In fact, critical race theory uh, departs from the, its, its two ancestors by using, um, using fictional little vignettes uh, narratives to to explain they they will say look at this, uh, this is, you know John Brown uh, he is a black man he goes to he he, he goes and applies for a job but his the, the the application is is racially biased they they use fiction little fiction stories to get their point across so I think that is one way I'm told that we can convince others I prefer to convince to to discuss ideas and to say, look, um, America has its problems. We do have racists. We need to deal with the racists in our midst. We need to, every time a racist act takes place, if it's illegal, we need to apply the full brunt of the law. There are many, many areas of life you cannot, you know, behave. You cannot not hire somebody because of race or sex or national origin. So, so we need to be very aware of that. But we also need to be aware that for all its problems, America is a, a, a huge experiment, a, an unheard of experiment in, in liberty and prosperity. We have a very long line of people out the door waiting to get in, my, including my parents uh, who got in 50, you know, my mom brought us, you know, 50 years ago, thank God for that. Um, and, and, and we still have a very long line of people waiting to get in. If we were so bad, that wouldn't be the case. So wh- well, how do we wanna change? What do we wanna change into? What other society is out there that we'd like to be more like? Peru, Portugal, Mm. uh, Chad, Thailand? What are the alternatives that people suggest that we become? Do we want to become better? Of course. And we, we, we do become better every day, but do we want to jettison the free market system, which, which is just another word for freedom. I own this and I want, you want to buy it. And we both agree on a price. You walk away happy and I walk away happy. Do they want to get rid of that? Uh, on your point about emotional language, yesterday on the show, we had a woman who grew up uh, in an orphanage in Ethiopia to come to America and live an amazing life. And on Friday's show, we talked about Alice Idraki, who grew up in a slum in Haiti and then came to America, went to West Point, and now flies Black Hawk helicopters, right? So two black immigrants, poor black immigrants, who are thriving and successful in America, right? right. Some, some racist country we are, right? Right. Um, so hopefully those stories are meaningful, but for some reason the, the negative stories seem to get more uh, attention and and are more powerful for whatever psychological reason that is. I, I'm very concerned, Mike, about our schools. This has infiltrated our schools, and it's going to be it's one thing to talk to this about your neighbor, but to your kids, uh, it's a whole other thing when all the other authority figures and cultural figures in their life are telling them this is real. So what's your suggestion there? Well, that is, and that has been systematic, um, uh, you know. The, 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 the takeover of the schools of ed, papers have been written about this, uh, completely suffused the, the curricula and schools of education, teachers, colleges, is suffused with critical race theory. The textbook that is most used is Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, which is all critical race theory. Uh, oh, I, here's an anecdote. Remember Bill Ayers, the domestic terrorist? 
um, uh, from the weather on the ground. When he decided that blowing up buildings and people was not the, 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 the way of life he wanted to pursue, he went to Columbia Teachers College and got a degree in education. Uh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah, they knew their game. Let me ask you this, Mike. This is important. I, I, we were talking to someone the other day, a right, black woman. Uh, she's conservative. And I said something like, I wish we can get, uh, we were talking about the black vote and how they voted in 2020. And I said, oh, I hate that term. I hope one day we can get to a future where we don't have these like voting blocks. And she said, no, I disagree. Uh, black people have, and Hispanic people and Asian people have unique policy whatevers that, that Republicans need to speak directly to. And I think she was trying to say that we need like to use judo against the left and like use these terms, but for our benefit. And I just feel very wary of using their language even. And I would like to push against that. Where do you stand on that debate? Oh, completely with what you just said. In fact, I'm writing a, a piece right now, which will be an op-ed or an essay, I'm not sure, exactly on that. I think conservatives have bought too much. I think the left is actually beginning to absorb the lessons of the, the, the 2020 uh, election. There was a piece by Matt, Matt Iglesias, who's no conservative. Uh, I think his last piece for Vox, in which he said, maybe the, the, uh, these so-called Hispanic voters do not see life the way we intellectuals in, in the, on the coasts want them to. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, all of, in fact, all of the, the, the biggest swings towards Trump all took place in the so-called Hispanic districts. There is no Hispanic vote. There is no Hispanic, uh, there is a Mexican-American vote perhaps, but there are many, many different Mexican-American votes. There's one in the Rio Grande Valley, yeah. which is different from the one in Houston or, or Austin, which is different again from the one in, 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 in LA. There's a Cuban-American vote in, in South Florida, which differs from the Cuban-American vote in New Jersey. Um, I do believe America, because we've had immigrants for so long, there has always been, for example, uh, 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 um, the, 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 the Hudson River Valley, um, uh, you know, they, there was a Dutch vote there in the, in the mm -hmm. 1700s and the early 1800s. Uh, President Van Buren was, I, I was told he was very good because he grew up speaking Dutch in, in a, in a little town in the, and so he, he spoke with the only president to speak with a foreign accent apparently was President, was wow. President Martin Van Buren and he was very good about getting the Dutch vote. Uh, so, so these things have existed, um, and and it's, mm. it's it's normal. The the, the, the German vote in, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, which 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 Franklin hated, um, but, wow. but my, my, what what I get from that is they, they exist, but then they also go away. Yes, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, right. No one talks about the Dutch vote anymore, <laughs> right. for yeah. for good reason. Right. Mike, I, I hate I hate we got to run. I hate to cut you off there, but everyone go first of all buy the book. The Plot to Change America by Mike Gonzalez. And then uh, at the very least, as your little intro, you can check out the Heritage Foundation's Critical Race Theory, The New Intolerance, Its Grip on America. And just look for Mike Gonzalez on Twitter and you can find it all right there. Uh, Mike, always good to talk to you, man. Let's do it again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, brother. Critical Race Theory. Do not let it infiltrate your or your kids' minds. Talk more about the Supreme Court case, the Texas Supreme Court case, tomorrow. True story. Mike Slater, spread the word.